have paused in John the fifth chapter. The scripture was read so ably before, but for the sake of our sermonic emphasis, we will pause at verse 8. You are turned there this morning. And as we do that, we are grateful for, again, all the mothers in the house today. Can you say amen? amen? If you are a mother, we won't make you stand. Just put your hand, all of our mothers, just put your hands in the air. Let's put, let's put our hands together and bless God for our mothers this morning. Thank God. We thank God for your power and your presence here today. John, the fifth chapter and uh, the eighth verse. Jesus looks at this lame man. The text says, Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. Rise. Take up your bed and walk. Who says amen to the word of God this morning? I want to place a tag on this text and preach for just a few moments this morning on the subject, the word can make you well. The word can make you well. Spirit of the living God, fall now afresh upon us. Please pay. Take a coal from the altar of heaven and place it on the lips of this preacher that I might proclaim the truths of God's word and the power of your word. This morning, not only that, I pray that your people would have eyes that they might see, ears that they might hear, and hearts that throb with the impulse of thy love. And if you would do that, we'd be careful, O oh God, to give you the praise, for we ask these blessings now in Jesus' name. Let God's people say, Amen. The word can make you well. This morning we find ourselves kneeling at the pool of Bethesda near the cot the bed, if you will, of a man whom the Bible declares has been lame for 38 years. I find it interesting that the Bible does not tell us his name, and I believe the reason this is so is because John, the author, wants us to put our name where his name should be because the fact is that his problem is our problem. The most disturbing portion of his sickness is not that he is paralyzed, a quadriplegic, some scholars would say. That is not the most disturbing reality. What's most disturbing is that the text declares that he's been like this for a long time. What's most disturbing is not that he's been sick, but what's troubling about this man's condition is that he's been sick for a long time. You see, if you face a short-term illness, then perhaps the reality or the prospect of healing is inevitable or imminent. But what do you do when hope has been buried six feet under and optimism has been eulogized? What do you do when the prospect of being made whole now seems a remote distance? How in the world do you hold on to Jesus when what you've been facing, you've now been facing for a long time. I dare would suggest that we don't need to ask the man how he feels, for I believe right here in this sanctuary are people who know what it's like to deal with issues that paralyze your spirituality and to deal with them for a long time. I mean, it's one thing to have an addiction and to struggle with hereditary sins, but but, but the problem you're having is not just that you're struggling. You've been struggling for a long time. It's not just that you face family dysfunction and marital upheaval. But the problem is that you've been going through this for a long time. It's not a problem that you've been praying. But the problem is that you've been praying the same prayer for such a long time 
that now you are beginning to question the potent power of God. The question that leaps from the pages of Scripture this morning is, do we serve a Jesus who's powerful enough to deal with problems that we've been facing for a long time? <laughs> Lord, I tell you, I can't wait to get into the sermon to answer this, for I must answer it now and declare to you that the God we serve is so powerful, not only can he deal with short-term issues, but Jesus has the power to deal with issues and sins and generational curses that you've been facing for a long time. Jesus has power, watch this, to deal with besetting sins. He has power to deal with generational sins. And he has power to deal with sins that you brought to church this morning and you thought that Jesus could not solve. Well, he's brought me here today to declare to you that if you are facing a challenge that has bound you for 38 or plus years, God's word can make you well. This is what the text says for Jesus now seeing the power of his word and the decrepit condition of this man stands over him and asks him a very simple question. And as I look at the question, I'm believing that Jesus will do what Jesus often does when someone is facing a despondent situation. Jesus will come down and touch the decrepit condition of mankind so that sinful human beings like you and I can be made whole. Have you ever felt a touch from Jesus? Have you ever felt what it's like just to be in the worship experience and you can feel that the presence of Jesus is in the place? Have you ever been in the prayer closet and you just know that while you may be by yourself that the unseen power of Jesus is in the prayer closet with you? Have you ever been touched by Jesus before? And so I'm waiting for Jesus to touch him because Jesus does his best work when he touches us. You remember when Jesus touched the man filled with leprosy in Matthew the 8th chapter. He touched him and made him well. You remember when Peter's mother-in-law was sick with the fever that would not break. And the Bible says in Mark 1 that Jesus touched Peter's mother-in-law and she was made well. And so I'm waiting for Jesus to begin to rehearse old methods and touch this paralytic man. But the Bible says that Jesus does not touch him at all. Rather, Jesus stands over him, watch this, and he speaks three phrases. He says, rise, take up your bed, and walk. I'm expecting for Jesus to touch him, but Jesus does not touch him. Jesus speaks a word to him. I'm waiting for Jesus to touch him, but Jesus does not touch him. Jesus says to him, rise, take up your bed, and walk. For a time I was struggling with the implications of this, wondering why Jesus did not touch the man until the Spirit of God said to me, Braun, this was no mistake. For you must understand that the reason I touched him or the reason that I spoke to him and did not touch him is because I wanted you to know that my word is just as powerful as my touch. He said, I, I, I could have touched him, but then you would have come to the place where you believe that every problem you have has to be solved by a touch. Then you would have to come to church and the pastor has to stir you up. The praise team has to prime your pump. You have to have somebody to make you feel like you've had an encounter with God. But Braun, I did not touch him. I spoke to him because I want you to know that in your darkest hour, when you feel that all hope is lost, sometimes you don't need a touch. Sometimes you just need his word and I don't know about you is there anybody here that can testify that the word of God is powerful can you testify today that the word of God is like dynamite I found out the other day or we saw the other day that the United States dropped a 15 plus ton bomb on 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 uh, the ISIL that was causing havoc in Syria and the news commentators were all aghast saying that they have never seen a bomb with this type of power before but I want to suggest to you today that if you think that bomb is powerful you ought to set off the bomb called the Word of God 
if you think that that bomb has cataclysmic power, then I dare you to unleash God's word on your problem. I dare you to unleash God's word on your children. I dare you to unleash God's word on your situation, and you will discover that not only will God's word heal, but God's word can change. I know what I'm talking about, for the fact is this is why 1 Peter 1 verses 23 declares to us this reality that we have in the word of God not a perishable seed, watch this, but a living seed. In other words, the Bible is telling us that in the word of God is buried everything that we need for change, transformation, and sanctification. You don't have to look other places. You can find it in the word. Well, this is Mother's Day, so let me illustrate it this way. I remember I was watching a pray, a spaghetti commercial, pray goo spaghetti sauce. You all remember that? Oh, everybody makes their own pray goo. Did I say it the correct way? Pray go. All right. Well, you know what I'm talking about. Say amen anyway. Pray go. Pardon moi. Spaghetti sauce. And it was funny to me because in the spirit of Mother's Day, I, I saw this mother who was standing over the spaghetti sauce. And then her son came behind her and began to ask her what's in the sauce. And the reason that he came behind her is because what he was smelling in the aroma did, ma did not match what he saw on the cutting board. And so he went to his mom and said, Mom, he said, I don't see the mushrooms. And the mother said, you don't see the mushrooms because it's already in the sauce. He said, Mom, but I don't see the sausage. And Mom said, you don't see the sausage because it's already in there. And then he said, Mom, but I don't see the ripe tomatoes. And Mom said, you don't see the ripe tomatoes because it's already in there. She said, you're looking for externals, but what you need to know is that it's already in the sauce. And you see, that's what God is saying to us regarding the Word of God. He's saying that everything you need from the Word of God is already in there. He says, do you need deliverance? It's already in there. He says, do you need healing and hope? It's already in there. You don't have to look elsewhere. The Bible declares that it's in the Word of God. He speaks to him, watch this, and the Bible declares that the man is healed immediately. He does not have to wear some things you have to wait for. You may have to wait, for those of you in the military, for security clearance. As a matter of fact, from what I hear, you have to wait a long time. You may have to wait for the mortgage to go through. You may have to wait, watch this, for the car loan to go through. But is there anybody here today that's grateful that when God issues a promise to his people, you do not have to wait. God gives his power right now. So the question that we are forced to ask ourselves today is this. How do we access this power from God's word? How do we access the power that can speak to a lame man and not touch him but speak to him? And he rise, take up his bed, and walk. I want to suggest to us today that the first thing that we must do is embedded in the text that we must replace in our lives all substitutes to the word of God. The Bible declares this man was asked a very simple question from Jesus. Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? That's a simple yes or no question, and yet the man responds very precariously to Jesus in John, the fifth chapter, and beginning with the seventh verse. Listen to the response of the man. The sick man answered him and said, sir, verse seven, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Now, don't miss this. Jesus asked the man, do you want to be made well? And the man looks at Jesus and says, mm, yeah, but I have no man to put me in the water. Jesus, the healer, asked the paralyzed man, do you want to be healed? And the paralyzed man looks at Jesus, the healer, and declares, no, I think I need a man. Jesus, the one who has more medicine in the hem of his garment than CVS and Walgreens combined, asks the man, do you want to be made well? And the man said, I have a God-sized problem, but I think I'll settle for a human intervention. 
And the reason that Jesus asked him this question is because he wants to expose the truth that if you really want to access the power of God's word, you cannot lean on substitutes when God's word alone will only do. Now, beloved, let me suggest to us today that there are two implications to this text. First of all, many of us have been relying on men to do what only God can do. Do I have a witness in this house today? Now, I know this is not a sermon for singles. This is Mother's Day weekend. But let me talk to those who perhaps right now are not married. For you, too, like the paralyzed man, young lady, may be saying, I want to be made whole, but I do not have a man. Can I spend time there for a moment? I can declare I'm an expert on being, I was single for 32 years, so I can speak some expertise on this matter. The man says, I want to be made whole, but there is no man to place me into the pool. Is there anybody here that knows that you don't need a man to be made whole? Can I get a witness in this house? Now, this is Mother's Day's weekend, and I don't want to downgrade men. I believe that men bring contributions to the family circle. Come on, brothers, you ought to say amen. I thank God for the brothers who are in my life. But I want to suggest to you that there is no man or woman who can do for us what Jesus has promised to do for us. You don't need a man first. You need Jesus Christ primary. This is the reality. I used to have folks all the time, when you get married, when you're going to jump the broom, I said, listen, I'm first trying to get to know Jesus. Because when I get to know him, perhaps he can show me the right direction. Do I have a witness in this house today? But that is not the primary application that Jesus wants to bear to mind. Jesus is troubled, hear me, because the man has chosen a human intervention when God wants to offer him the power of his word. He's saying, I need a human intervention. And the challenge we have today is that many of us right now are desiring to access God's power, but we have human methodologies that God needs to get rid of. He says, yeah, you want God's power, but I need you to rearrange your prayer life. Because I need to make sure that God, that you seek me first, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, watch this, and all these things shall be what? Added unto you. This is the reality. Now, I'm not suggesting to us today that God is declaring that we ought to live a life of passive piety. The scriptures are filled with action words. Let me get my, the scriptures are filled with action words for those of us who are yearning for and searching after salvation. The Bible declares us that we ought to resist temptation, amen? The Bible tells us that we ought to strive towards holiness. But you must understand that when the Bible declares and calls us to action, it is not an action that we must do without God's power. It is a reaction that he's calling us to do in response to God's power. You see, when God has come and shadowed you with the power of his word, there is nothing that we are incapable of doing because God's word, watch this, has creative power. It has creative power. So you may be asking, preacher, how does, how does God's word, how can God's word make us whole? How can God's word make us well? Well, you must understand that this is the reason that Christ made perfectly clear in Genesis, the first through the third chapter, what his word could do. You remember the creation narrative. The Bible declares that the earth was void and without form. And in the context of an empty world, the Bible declares that Jesus and God and the Spirit spoke the word and created something out of nothing. It was empty first, but when God's word came to the fruition, what was empty is now made complete. And I want to suggest to you today, beloved, that if you, are, if you have come to the house of God empty, there is nothing that can fill us more than the power of the word of Jesus Christ. But there's a second thing I believe that the scriptures are teaching us today. For not only is God teaching us that if, in fact, we desire to receive the power of his word, we must not only replace substitutes, but the text declares that we must disregard the traditions of man and obey the word of God. It's right here in the text in John the fifth chapter beginning with the eighth verse. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible declares that Jesus went to the man and said to him, watch this, rise. Is it on the screen? Yes. Rise. What does he say? Take up your what? And then do what? Let's read it again. He says what? Rise. He says, take up your what? And walk. Now you must understand that Jesus knows exactly what he's doing. Jesus is placing this man in absolute contradiction 
with the pharisaical and legalistic scribes who have made the Sabbath a burden rather than a joy. And let me pause here and suggest that one of the dangers of this church is that we make what God has given to us as a joy a burden. The other day I had someone ask, say, why in the world are the members from CPC out cleaning up and fixing houses on the Sabbath? And I declare the reason that we're doing fixing houses and cleaning on the Sabbath is because I believe that if Jesus were a member of CPC, that he would spend less time in the sanctuary and more time in the streets. Do you hear me today? We'd be shocked sometimes how Jesus kept the Sabbath because Jesus was not concerned about coming and all of the time being consumed with eating. Jesus came to feed lost sheep. And so now this man, watch me, the text is clear that this man is in contradiction with the Mishnah, which declares that you are breaking the Sabbath if you carry your mat more than 10 paces on God's Sabbath day. So we are not surprised in John the 5th chapter and the 10th verse when the scribes come to this layman and listen to what they said. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the what everybody? It is not what? Lawful for you to what? To carry your bed. Now, I find it interesting that Jesus calls the man, watch this, to violate the traditions of man in response to his healing. <clears throat> Say that again. I find it interesting that when you are healed, that tradition no longer governs you. But when you've been healed, you are now able to hear and to see what God has to say to you. You see, one of the evidences that we've yet to receive the true healing from Christ is that we are governed by tradition and not governed by the Word of God. But when you have been freed by Jesus, you are like this lame man. You don't care what people have to say. You don't care what your tradition is. I will follow God and God only. And I want to declare to you today that this is one of the reasons why this preacher has decided to keep God's Sabbath day holy. Not because I need to keep it holy to be made well. I want to keep God's day holy in celebration of being made well. Notice, watch this, that the man does not obey, hear me, the man does not obey in order to receive his healing. The man has been healed, now he obeys. Notice that the man is observing the Sabbath not to be saved and not to be healed, but he's observing the Sabbath because the healer has changed his life. And this is why, beloved, I believe that God is calling us to observe his Sabbath, not because we are observing it in order to be made whole, but the Sabbath is literally a celebration of God healing my spiritual paralysis. Every time the Sabbath rolls around, it is a reminder to me that without Jesus, I am paralyzed. Every time the Sabbath rolls around, it's a reminder that without Jesus, I am sitting by the pool of Bethesda. And if God does not come rescue me, I will have no hope. But God says the Sabbath does not save, but I want to remind you of your salvation on my day. This is why I've learned now that I have to take my foot off God's Sabbath. I must confess that there have not always been times when I've been as faithful as I should have been with God's Sabbath. Come on and say amen. amen. I don't, listen, don't sit up here and act pious. You know, I've been in the store sometimes looking for y'all and y'all looking for me about Friday. Huh? Are you hearing me? Hoping that the sun does not catch me on God's holy day. And I'm not suggesting that we ought to engage in some type of legalistic activity that we guard the edges of the Sabbath and lose the joy. But I am suggesting that when we do not honor what God has given to us, we fail to have an opportunity to tell God, thank you for setting me free. That's what the Sabbath is to me. It's just an opportunity to say, God, thank you. I was paralyzed, but I'm whole, thank you. I was lost, but I've, now I've been found, thank you. Every time Friday goes down and the day dies in the West, I recognize that my sins have been buried in the sea of forgetfulness. And God says, this day is a memorial of my healing of your paralysis. He said, he'll do it. This is why, hear me, church, this is why, the Sabbath will be a test of loyalty in the last days. Because if I read the text correctly, 
the Bible is clear that some are not obeying God because they've not been convicted. But some are not obeying God because they've not demonstrated appreciation for being healed. Because when you have, here, listen to me, when you have been healed, you will do anything the healer asks you to do. Are you hearing me now? When you have been healed, if the healer says, I don't want you worshiping false gods, no problem, because I'm worshiping a healer. If the healer says, I want you to return a faithful tithe and a generous offering, no problem because I've been healed. If the healer says, I want you to worship on my, my day, no problem because I'm worshiping a healer. I'm not trying to get there. I'm already there. And Jesus declares, just show my appreciation. So the man says, no. He says, I can't, I can't toss down my mat. Because now that I've been set free, I've been set free not only from my disease, but I've been set free from tradition. I've been set free from tradition that violates and steals from us the power of God's word. But I believe there's something else that Jesus wants to share to us in this text. For if we truly want to harness the power of God's word, the Bible also declares to us today that the third thing we must do is we must position ourselves to receive the power of his word. Notice from the text here today in John the fifth chapter, beginning with the 14th verse, a very unique reality. For the Bible declares in John 5, 14, afterward, Jesus found him in the temple, listen to this, and said to him, see you've been made well, sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Now wait just a minute, before you get to the last part, we're coming, we're coming to the last part, but before you become to the last portion of this verse, watch what Jesus declares to the man regarding who finds who. Because if you notice in the text, the Bible says that while the man was in the temple, we don't know if he's going to find Jesus or not. We do know that he was going to a place where Jesus could be found. And watch this. When you go to a place where Jesus can be found, you don't have to worry about finding Jesus. Jesus will find you. What do you mean, Pastor? It's right in the text. The Bible says, afterward, Jesus found him. Now, let me tell you why that's good news. See, some of us have a view of God that, that God is playing some type of spiritual hide and seek with spiritual power. That, in fact, we can access God if we say the right prayer or have the right formula. But I want to suggest to you today that God is not stingy, nor is he shallow with dispensing his healing. God is not waiting for you to find him. God says, I'm going to come and find you. Because God understands, listen, God understands, listen, some folk, I can't trust you with your salvation. God says, because if I put it in your hands, some days you're up, some days you're down. So God says, because I love you so much, I'm going to take salvation out of your hands. I'm going to put it in my hands so that being saved is not an item of finding God. It's an item of responding to God. And if you respond to God, beloved, the Bible declares that Jesus can save and Jesus can heal. Then he tells them, he says, see that you've been made well. He says, sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Please don't suggest here that Jesus is declaring that this man can live a life of sin, can live a life of perfection. One of the things that will drive you crazy is believing that you can live a life of absolute perfection. The only person who was perfect is a person born 2,000 years ago, born of a virgin that is the only person who can ever claim perfection. Everybody else in this church is dysfunctional. That's a hard word. Let me say it again. Everybody in this church besides Jesus has issues. Let me say it another way. Everybody in the church has sins that we will struggle with until the time that Jesus cracks the skies. But I want to suggest today that one of the things that Jesus can give to us is a life of victory. Because I don't care what anybody says, the things that you struggled with last year, you don't have to struggle with today. God can move us from victory to victory. Can the church say amen? He says, now that you have found the power of my word, he says you can be changed because the word can make you well. 
Now, beloved, let me share this before we close our time today. One of the realities that we're facing now in the, in the church of Jesus Christ is because, because we have so much access to the Bible, I believe that we have lost the potency of what we hold. Think about it now. We have the Bible everywhere. You have the Bible on your job, Bible on your office, have the Bible on your iPhone, and now it's become just another app. And you don't even realize that right there on that device you have is a spiritual nuclear bomb that can eradicate every demonic stronghold in your life. That's why, this is why we have to guard the time that we spend with Jesus in the morning and the evenings. Because God says that's a time when the word is doing more than comforting you. That's a time when the word is making you well. You don't even know it that when you spend time with God that he is beginning, he is beginning a transformation inside of you. There are times as a youngster when I thought that I had to memorize scripture and hated it because my mother, come on, you know how it is. Your mom stands you up here 13 Sabbath, makes you recite all 13 verses and stares you down if you mess up on one because she does not want to be embarrassed. Come on, say amen. And I'm thinking to myself, Lord, if I could just get out of the memorization process. But there have been times in my life when I've been faced with temptation that I could not find. And the one scripture that saved me was the 13th Sabbath scripture that my mama made me memorize. I had no idea that at six years old, the word was healing me. The word was transforming me. It was making me over again. And God said, what I did 30 years ago, I can do right now in the church. But you got to put yourself in a position to receive his power. Because when you do, God said, I can heal your spiritual paralysis so that the things that have hindered you will hinder you no longer. I believe in it. I've seen men in my church. And I've seen women in my church women in my church who have come to God and when we first saw them we did not think it was much that God could do with them we looked at them and what we saw was a paralyzed man who had been sitting by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years but they started chewing on the Word of God feasting on the Word of God and now we see them we don't even recognize them the visage of sin has been eradicated. The impact of transgression has been obliterated. And now we're looking at a person who's been made brand new. They were not, watch this, they were not made brand new by a self-help program. They were not made over again because of self-preservation or self-strength. They did, watch, they did not find release from their bondage and addictions because they had enough willpower. You know how they were made over again, the word made them well. Jesus said to them, rise, take up your bed, and walk. And when you respond to the word of God, there is a power in your life that you will never be able to duplicate because it's only found in the word. I want you to listen to the words of this song today because God is calling us to make a determination as a church family. Will we settle for substitutes or do we want a clear thus saith the Lord? Will we settle for second best or are we going to make space for the power of God's word in our lives? I want you to listen to the words of this song before I appeal. God has something to say to his people today. We don't need another political uprising. Yes. We don't need another conqueror on the scene. What we need is a special word that will burn within our hearts and give us direction. From above, we need a word from the Lord, a word.
from the Lord, just one word from the Lord to remove all our doubts and cause the sun to shine and get peace of mind. Speak, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Oh, speak. Lord, we lack thy wisdom and thy understanding, oh yes. And Lord, we lack the very love you showed in your son. And Lord, we altered in our ways and we have so much to gain. So give us your word, Lord. So give us your word, Lord, we need a, a word from the Lord, a word from the Lord, just one word from the Lord who will renew all our doubts and cause the sun to shine. in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a reason that Jesus didn't touch him. He spoke to him. And he spoke to him because he wanted him and he wants us to know. That sometimes you don't need a touch. Sometimes you just need a word from the Lord. This is the call that God has place on the hearts of his people today and this appeal is threefold in nature. I believe first of all that some of us in this church we've been dealing with some things for a long time. I don't know what it is but like that man by the pool you've been sitting there and you're wondering if God has power for your situation where he says yes I do but it's the word that's going to make you well. It's the word of God. Rise. Take up your bed and walk. Well, how do we gain access to that word? Well, first, I believe God is calling us to remove all substitutes that we now have in place of God's word. You don't need a man-made intervention for a God-sized problem. You need God, and you need God's word. Today, somebody right, right now, what do you mean, pastor? How does, how does that work? I believe God is calling some of us to, uh, I'd say it, I've said it before, but but the Word of God, the Word of God, reading it, studying it, and obeying it, because that's where the power comes, can unleash a transformation in your life that you will never accomplish on your own. Let God do it. 
I promise you, whenever you're facing a void in your life, just replace it with a promise from the Word of God and watch what He does. What He's spoken to you, He will start doing in you. He'll change you. But there's a second thing. God says, I, I need you to demonstrate appreciation for my healing. By steadfast obedience, by rejecting the traditions of men and embracing the truths of God's Word. That's the reason we are who we are as a people. We've decided that God has made us well, and because he's made us well, there is nothing that I will not do for the healer. Yes, yes. Nothing I won't do for him. And so today the healer is saying, will you give to me your unreserved obedience? Will you humble yourself at the sight of God's word? And then finally, God is saying, I need you to position yourself in a place where I may be found. And when you do that, you don't have to look for me. I'll come find you. God is saying to somebody here today, there's a time, there's a slot in your day that God is asking for unreserved commitment for him. Not time for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or any other type of gram. God says it's me and you and the word. And watch what God will do. He will transform your life so that you experience the same victory that the paralyzed man experienced. And he says, I need that space and time with you today. And if that's your desire, if you believe that God can do that, if you're saying, Pastor, I'm making commitment, no more substitutions, nothing else that is prioritized in the place of God's word, I'm making a commitment today that I will obey him, though the earth be moved and the heavens fall, and I'm making a commitment that there's a space in my day that's reserved for God and for his word. Would you stand with me? We're going to close on this appeal today, asking God to do what he's promised in this house. Father, your people are standing even now. And the appeal, Lord, is extended beyond this because there's someone here today. You need to give your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. The Lord says, I want to make you whole again. I want to make you well again. Where are you today? God is calling you to give your heart and your life to him through baptism or rebaptism. We invite you to slide out of your seat. Give us your hand, but give Jesus your heart. We're praying for you specifically right now. Where are you? Just slide out right now as this time is for you. God is saying, I'm calling you because I want the word to make you well. You're here today. The spirit of Jesus is moving on your heart and your mind. Just a few more moments. This time is for you. God is calling. He's moving on your heart. We're closing now. Father, while we conclude this prayer, the doors of heaven are still open, but this appeal is simple and profound. First, we are determined, Father, that all substitutes must be eradicated from our lives. We will not use a man-made solution for a God-sized problem. It's God's word or bust. We determine to give our lives and our hearts to you and to reject tradition for the word and the will of God. And we're determined today, God, that you will find us in a place where we can be found. And when we come to a place where you may be found, you promise to come find us. That space in our day is just for you. And we thank you, God, for what you have done and for the power that you have unleashed. For we ask these blessings now. In the name of Jesus Christ, let those who believe say amen. amen. Come on, say amen again. Amen. amen. You may be seated in God's presence.